idea of heaven is to open the fridge door and find it filled with leftovers. I'd far rather prepare dinner based on leftovers than start with a blank canvas. I mean, leftovers talk to me. They tell me what to do with them. They tell me how to invent new uses for them. Like my charred tomato chicken in tortilla soup, using last night's chicken. I serve it with my quick fix Mexican style coleslaw for a really easy, tasty meal. Then don't throw out that extra pasta because any kind of cooked pasta can star again in my brie bacon and spaghetti frittata. On the side, bright, beautiful kale dressed with lemon and extra virgin olive oil. Leftovers, today on Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Funding provided by Family owned and Indiana grown, Maple Leaf Farms is a proud sponsor of Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Providing a variety of duck products for home kitchens, Maple Leaf Farms Duck helps inspire culinary adventures everywhere. Maple Leaf Farms. Subaru builds vehicles like the versatile Subaru Forester with symmetrical all wheel drive and plenty of cargo room. A recipe made for whatever the day brings. Subaru. A proud sponsor of Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Ezra's Feta Cheese. Family made for more than a century. Hi. Hi, how you doing? Good. I'd like to get a grilled cheese from chicken. Sure. My charred tomato chicken and tortilla soup is so tasty for a few reasons. First of all, the ingredients, they're just great ingredients. Secondly, they sort of get broiled and that makes them all charred and smoky. And when you put it all together, it's just a great vehicle for leftover rotisserie chicken. It becomes a meal. I've got my corn here, husking it. So two ears of corn and then some plum tomatoes. We need about two and a half pounds. Because this is really the base. It's like a tomato soup. And then we have some onions that I'm going to cut in half. And we're going to broil. We're broiling. I've already preheated the broiler. The onions and the garlic with the skin on. The idea being that they'll be protected by their skin but still roast. Uh, we're doing two things. We're getting it all nicely browned and sort of charred around the edges, which gives us that smoky taste. But we need them all to get really soft. Afterwards, in their pureed, we're going to reheat them, but this is really going to cook them. It takes, um, oh, about 10 minutes for the corn and up to, you know, 18 minutes for everything else. You just have to watch it and keep turning it and looking at it until it's nice and soft and got that great charred edge. And you'll smell it. It's going to let you know when it's getting there. All right, now we're also going to make some tortilla strips. And I'm going to flavor them first. These are oven-baked tortilla strips. If you were in a rush, you could certainly use bought, bought tortilla chips. Um, but why not just make your own? It's so simple. We only need four for this recipe. Well, one of them is going to thicken the soup. And the other three are going to be the strips in the soup. And I'm going to make a little mixture with a tablespoon of oil. There we go. OK, a tablespoon of oil and a teaspoon of chili powder. If you want, you can go with a pure chili powder, like an uh, ancho or a pasilla or even a chipotle, and that would be fun. Uh, because the packaged mixes also have oregano, sometimes sugar, sometimes salt. So pure chili powder is a good way to go, but it's your choice. Um, OK, and then I'm going to add just a pinch of salt. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, this is sort of fun, to paint your food. Let me show you a little trick. I'm going to paint two of these and then make a sandwich, and you'll see how that works. You can use all, you can make all sorts of flavored tortilla chips by just mixing oil with different flavors, different spices, and then you sandwich them. Okay, now one of these we're going to save. See, you see, then the oil goes on both sides. One of these we're just going to save 
as our thickener. So, in, so to remind myself not to cut it up, I'm going to put it down here for later on. And then these guys all get cut into strips. So you cut them in half first. And now if you only have one oven, you can put the uh, tortilla chips on the bottom shelf while the top shelf is broiling and they'll still get nice and toasty. So spread them out in one layer. And I'm, because I, I do have two ovens, I'm just gonna pop them in the bottom one. All right, 400 degrees, six minutes. Let's see what's going on up here. Oh, not too much just yet. No, oh yeah, the tomatoes are getting a little bit. All right, I'll come back and check. You just have to babysit a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna get my garnishes ready. I need some cheddar cheese and I'm gonna grate that and some cilantro. If your family hates cilantro, you could certainly use basil or some other herb. But I've got a little trick. Uh, when I like to grate my cheese, it's so much easier if it's been partially frozen. So if that's been in the freezer for, you know, 10 minutes, it just hardens up. Because you know how it becomes so gluey when it's really soft? You sort of end up with a cheese ball. Um, this is a great way to store these kind of herbs. This is cilantro. What you do is you treat them like flowers. And they'll really keep for quite a while. I can do my cheese first. I'm going to use the coarse side of a four-sided grater. I need about a quarter cup of this cheddar. You know, you can get um, the white cheddar as well. The difference between the white and the orange is not so terrible. It's uh, colored with annatto seed. Um, you know how with parsley or with basil, you always lose the stems. Well, you really don't need to with cilantro. I'm gonna just lose the very bottom. You know, you don't have to stand there and like pick off each little tiny leaf because the stems are so tender and they've got so much flavor. You might as well just leave them in. Okay, I'm smelling them. I bet that my vegetables are ready and I bet you so are my tortillas. Let's have a look. Oh yes, these are beautiful. Wow, okay. That's gonna give me so much flavor. And let's see how these guys are doing. Oh yes, perfect. If they're nice, oh yeah, very nice. Okay, I'm just gonna let those cool. And uh, so here's my leftover chicken from last night, my rotisserie chicken. And I'm just gonna shred it by hand or, you know, you can cut it. I love rotisserie chicken. You know, I never met a rotisserie chicken I didn't like. It's just great and you can use it for so many dishes. This is like my favorite thing for leftovers. Great in sandwiches. Of course, it's good for quesadillas. It's good for enchiladas. I'm using leftover rotisserie chicken, but if you roasted your own chicken, terrific. Let's say you had some poached chicken, wonderful. Some leftover chicken from chicken sandwiches, leftover turkey, all of that would work here. Okay, so there we go. All right, cutting corn off the cob. There's many different ways to do it. There's all sorts of tricks. I just do it this way, and yeah, it flies, but if you have a nice piece of parchment as I do, I feel secure here that I'm getting all the corn off. I have a friend, I'm gonna show you how he does it on the second one. I just, you know how you get comfortable with certain ways of doing things? You just feel like you're in control. So what he does is he, uh, this is Joey Altman from California. He just lays it flat, which makes so much sense in terms of um, not letting the corn fly. So you can pick which way you wanna do it. So there's my corn, but now I've gotta get the rest of the vegetables ready. Put this here. I'm gonna start with my tomatoes. What we need to do is just peel them. Okay, very easy. We're gonna add every part of the tomato. Now, when I went to cooking school, I was trained in the French way. I was told to remove, oh, of course, the peel, because it's, um, you know, it's tough, but also to remove the seeds. And since then, I've learned that it's actually, the, the seeds have tons of flavor. And we're gonna blend this whole thing up, so why lose them? Because they're just gonna get pulverized in there. And they're gonna add so much flavor. Get off the peel from the onion. You see this wonderful charred part? This is gonna add great flavor. And finally, I will do the garlic. Okay, it's time to make soup. Pick this up now, it's cooled off. 
So all of this goes right into my blender. Now, let me say something. You could certainly do this in a food processor. You could certainly use an immersion blender if you threw this all into the pot. But nothing makes a smooth puree like a good old fashioned blender like this. I'm gonna do it in a few stages. It's just easier to blend. Well, I'm glad I put that little bit in there. I think I would have been wearing it if I put the whole thing in. I need to, mm, that needs salt. Okay, this goes in here. I guess I could have just added the salt to that. But meanwhile, did you appreciate the texture on that? How fine it got, how pureed it got? You wouldn't get it that fine in a food processor or a handheld that's an immersion blender. It was just not the same. Remember our trusty tortilla. You can see that's already thick. So you could actually leave this out, but it adds a wonderful flavor as well. We could have toasted the tortilla too with the rest of the tortilla chips before we put it in here. Either way, it's gonna be good. All right, so we're gonna heat this up. Basically, the soup is done. Do you believe it? So I'm, I'm adding 14 ounces of chicken broth, about one and three quarters cup, and I'm adding it really for flavor, even though I've already thickened the broth. I like that chicken flavor. There goes our grilled corn. Oops. There we go. So while that heats, I'm just gonna get my, uh, some little bit of lime juice ready here. And uh, you can nuke it, really helps to get the juice out. So another thing to do is to bruise it abuse it, lean on it. You know how limes don't really like to give it up. So we're just gonna put this right in there. Let me just put, I'm gonna put a little more salt. I'm gonna put some black pepper in. Ah, oh, how could I forget my tortilla chips? Let me get those. All right, I have a little bowl over here for my tortilla strips. That way everybody can garnish their own. Okay, I'm seeing bubbles. We're in business. Oh, my favorite dinner, soup. Let me put all of the special stuff on there. Some cheese, some cilantro, and some tortilla strips. And to serve on the side, I've got a Mexican coleslaw that's been dressed with a buttermilk chipotle dressing. Yum. Wow. And you saw how quickly it was to make this soup. This is my kind of soup. Charred tomato and chicken tortilla soup, taking advantage of rotisserie chicken on a weeknight. Can't do any better than that. Mama girl, girl. So this is where they all graze? This is where all the chickens graze, yes they do. And what size would you say these are? These are basically, right now, large. I have some leftover spaghetti from last night, but I didn't throw it out. I'm no dummy. I'm going to turn this into the base of a meal. I'm going to make an Italian frittata. An Italian frittata, the Italians would hate to hear this, is like a French omelet set more substantial. And I'm gonna start with bacon. I'm gonna chop up and get cooking. You could cook it whole and then shred it up afterwards, but I'm just sort of speeding it up this way. And it doesn't need to be finely chopped. What's great about a frittata, it's just like an omelet. You can put absolutely anything in it. But I think you're gonna love this version with the spaghetti in it because it's just sort of a fun way to use up spaghetti. A lot of people just throw out their extra pasta, which is silly. You should never throw anything out. That actually this frittata could be a base for all sorts of leftovers. And then into the pan. Now today I'm using a stick resistant pan, um, which is perfect for eggs. You could use a nonstick pan. You could even use a cast iron skillet if you want. And I'm just getting it in there and then I'm turning on the heat. And it's gonna take about six minutes or so. We just want it to get nice and crispy. 
and we'll break it up a little bit. Okay, now walnuts. I love walnuts. We need about a quarter of a cup. If you're not a walnut fan or if you happen to have some other nuts in house, pine nuts would be great. Almonds would be fantastic. One of my new favorites is pistachios. I love pistachios. A little tip about nuts is nuts and seeds, all nuts and all seeds, because they have such a high oil content, can go rancid very quickly. So I keep mine in the freezer. I have them all in little bags, you know, I get rid of the uh, air, squeeze it out. Likewise, with nut oils and seed oils, like your sesame oil and your walnut oil, uh, keep those in the fridge because those go rancid very quickly too. But, you know, I've had nuts in my freezer, don't tell anybody, for quite a while. And they, um, they're really just fine. All right, so these chopped nuts are going to go in a 350 degree oven eh, for about 8 to 10 minutes or until they, are, you know, they change color and they have that toast, wonderful toasty aroma. Okay, now I'm going to do my onion. Ooh, the bacon smells good all, already. You know, there's just something about bacon, that smokiness, that makes us all feel sort of cozy inside. There we go. And then that's all ready to go when my bacon is done. So let me start getting all the rest of the bits. There's many things that go into this frittata. This is sort of a Dagwood frittata. There's so much in there. I'm gonna get my brie, um, which is, was very ripe and soft and wonderful, so I decided to put it in the freezer. See, that made it firm up just enough so that I can cut it. Now, any cheese would do in here, but this is, Again, a really good use of leftovers. So let's say you have a little bit of cheddar in there or a little bit of Gruyere or a little bit of Parmesan even. Uh, this would be a great place to use it. I'm using about six ounces of brie. So I'm not taking off the rind. We all know that rind is edible. And although my daughter Ruthie probably would not approve, too bad, she'll never know. Alrighty. Bring this down. Everything is going to eventually go in my egg bowl. So speaking of eggs, let me get my eggs going here. These are large eggs. I love eggs because, you know, if you have eggs in the fridge, you can make so many different dishes from them. Now, if you have a garden out back, you probably already know this, that eggshells are very good fertilizer. At my parents' farmhouse, we have, um, compost, and one of the things that we're never allowed to throw out are eggshells. Okay, so I'm going to beat my eggs with a little bit of pepper. Yeah, it's coarse, but who cares? I like, I like a little bit of freshly ground pepper in there, and some salt. And something I just learned, again, is it helps if you break the yolk before you start beating the egg. It seems to beat up faster. This reminds me of my dad still has what my grandmother had, one of those old-fashioned beaters that I bet young people don't know about, the kind that you whirl around like that. And every year at, at, the, at Christmas, when he makes us low and slow scrambled eggs, that's his tool of choice. All right. I think my bacon's just about ready. Now we're going to cook the uh, onion in the fat left in the pan. You could dump some of the fat off if you wanted to. All right. So here goes the onion. And we can cook these real quickly. You know, there's two different ways to brown onions. One is low and slow, and the other one is just sort of fast and get it charred at the edges. It's up to you how you're feeling. So while these brown up, I'm going to add the brie to my eggs, and then up a little bit. See, as it softened, I should have put these in right away because they were a little bit frozen. Okay, now I can't forget the start of the show, which is my spaghetti. Uh, now, you know when you cook spaghetti or any kind of pasta and you drain it and park it overnight, sometimes it becomes one. So let's see. If it does become one, I have a little trick so that you can sort of loosen it up for your frittata. Um, this actually, wow, this is really quite loose. But let's say it did get all gummy. 
what I would do is just put it in a strainer and then dip it in a, some boiling water just real quick, just to loosen it up. But it's in great shape. So there we go, into my eggs. Now I'm gonna add the bacon. Now I'm gonna take out my walnuts. Oh, those look good. Those won't take any time at all. Another stir on my onions, and then talk about kale for a second. Yeah, actually I'm gonna say those are done. So here we go, in goes the onions. And what the heck, I'm gonna add the walnuts. You could let them cool a little longer. The only reason for that is when they're hot, they absorb liquid quickly, they might sog up faster, but it doesn't really matter. You could also, frankly, save the walnuts and just sprinkle them on top when you're all done. It's up to you. So now back into the pan, we are going to put our egg mixture. Let me just toss it up one more time. Boy, that looks good all by itself, doesn't it? It's a rather dense omelet because of all this pasta in there. Okay, so this takes about four or five minutes to set. You know, you can lift it up a little bit. My mom taught me this about when you make a regular omelet, you sort of lift up the sides. You let, let the runny stuff go underneath. There doesn't seem to be too much runny stuff down there. So let me just get that started. And then I'm gonna come on down here and make a kale salad. Now kale is the it vegetable of the day because it is so healthy. It's got more iron than some meat. It's got more calcium per volume than milk. It's the super vegetable. Uh, we got three different versions of it here. Uh, this is the Tuscan dinosaur, and then this is the red, and this is the regular curly. The trouble with kale, I mean, there's no trouble, it's wonderful. Uh, you can cook it, and it can be tough, so you just cook it a little longer. But to eat it raw, which is what we've got here, is some beautiful shredded kale, you need to massage it to soften it. So um, I'm going to add a little bit of oil and a little bit of salt, but uh, then I'm going to literally mush this up with my hands. And what that does is just the physical massaging really tenderizes the kale. So I'm gonna be right back. Just pop this into the broiler. Okay. You wanna have the uh, heat source, yeah, not exactly right next to the broiler because you don't wanna get it too burnt. Okay, gonna get good and dirty. This is sort of fun. So you get your hands in there and you just smush it and smush it and smush it. And what happens is it not only gets tender, it gets translucent. See how it's already beginning to glisten? And I'm gonna put a little bit of lemon juice in it. It's not too much lemon. We don't wanna overwhelm the uh, olive oil. Isn't that beautiful? Really, I think you should make this part of the Wheatley lineup. It's such a great side salad. Let me check my frittata. It should be nice and golden by now. Ooh, yes. Gotta remember to be careful with that handle. Ooh, yum. Look at that. Woo! I'm gonna do this because this is a stick resistant pan and I do not want to scratch it. Wow, that looks so delicious. I think this is gonna be quite the crowd pleaser. So there we go. I'm gonna put a little kale salad next to it and that makes a beautiful dinner. Wowie sowie, I can't wait to try it. What kind of wine would you serve with this? I'd say a Beaujolais, we're being rustic. It's like we're in a bistro, having eggs for supper. And uh, Beaujolais goes, it's a, a very food friendly wine. It goes with so many things. So there you have it. Leftovers are a great way to stretch the dinner dollar. And they don't have to be ho-hum. As a matter of fact, creative use of leftovers helps you to get dinner on the table much faster. You're not starting with that blank canvas. I'm Sarah Moulton, thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time on Sarah's Weeknight Meals.
Sarah's Weeknight Meals continues online. For recipes, helpful tips, messages, and lots more, visit us on the web at sarahmoulton.com forward slash weeknight meals. Funding provided by... Family owned and Indiana grown, Maple Leaf Farms is a proud sponsor of Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Providing a variety of duck products for home kitchens, Maple Leaf Farms Duck helps inspire culinary adventures everywhere. Maple Leaf Farms. Subaru builds vehicles like the versatile Subaru Forester with symmetrical all-wheel drive and plenty of cargo room. A recipe made for whatever the day brings. Subaru, a proud sponsor of Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Ezra's Feta Cheese, family made for more than a century.